book of Matthew. We are going to pick up in chapter 20, where we were last week. Matthew chapter 20. And we had went through verse 16 last week. And so we'll be picking up at verse 17. Back in chapter 18, which we haven't looked at here in this series that I've been going through, but in, in chapter 18, um, Jesus was asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he had said, Whoever takes the lowly position of a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then that tied very much into what we talked about uh, last week with the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And, and you know, the, the, the guys were, again, concerned, concerned about getting their heavenly rewards. And, and Jesus was saying, you know, you might be surprised at, at who's first in line as far as getting their heavenly rewards and so forth. And you need to have your, your thoughts and your desires on the right things as you go through life and not be thinking about having more rewards than somebody else, but thinking about am I doing what I'm called to do and all those kinds of things. And so then we, we get to verses 17 through 19 then, <clears throat> and we'll see that this, this theme continues. And we'll see that it doesn't continue real well. Not, not, it's, it's not going real well for the, for the 12. And you know who I mean by the 12. Those 12 closest followers of, of, of Jesus. So let's read verses 17 through 19 to start. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. And on the way, He took the 12 aside and He said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn Him to death and will hand him over to, to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. So these verses then set the stage for the next verses that come up, verses 20 through 28. And though, though Jesus here, and he's telling them, he's facing what? Ultimately, he's facing death. He's facing death by crucifixion. His disciples who still aren't getting it, who still aren't understanding, primarily probably because they are looking for something very different, and their hearts and minds are set on something very different, and Jesus tells them th this stuff, and they're still not getting it. They're, they're arguing about their places in the kingdom. Jesus said they were all going to Jerusalem because there, who would be betrayed, mocked, and horribly whipped and crucified? The Son of Man. He would be condemned. His death would be the result of, of legal proceedings. The twelve disciples obviously didn't understand Jesus' statement about being crucified, about the statement that the Son of Man was going to be crucified and that, or raised to life. You can see Luke chapter 18 for a similar account. These next verses demonstrate that they still weren't picking up what Jesus was laying down. And I mean... Surely they understood who he meant by the Son of Man, but maybe not. Maybe they still not get, they're still not getting that. We'll talk here about like what they had their minds on. And we're going to see that right away. I hope you all read these verses already anyway. But look at verses 20 through 23 with me. 20 through 23. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup? I am going to drink. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. And so even though Jesus had just predicted his own suffering and murder, referring to himself as the Son of Man, his disciples, and who were the sons of Zebedee? James, James and John. Jesus had all, previously called them what? The sons of thunder, good. 
They come along with their mother, and I will tell you from, if you put the pieces together from Matthew 27, verse 56, Mark 15, verse 40, Mark 16, verse 1, their mother's name was Salome. Nowhere in the Bible does it actually say that, but if you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, you can see that it was her, it was her name was Salome, and I'm, I'm not going to explain all that. You can go to those verses, and I think you'll be able to figure it out. And so, James and John and their mama, they're still thinking about positions and power in the kingdom. Jesus just made a statement, which was actually like the third time that He had told them that He was, he was going to die. And here He said He would be raised to life. Now He referred to Himself again as the Son of Man, but He just said that. He just said that, and they're asking a question about, can we have one of the positions of power in your kingdom? People in that kingdom, if you were said to sit at the right hand of, of the king's throne, you were like the next in power. And the one on the left of the throne was then the next one in power to that. That was kind of how, how it was pictured in those days. And so they're basically saying, can we be your two most important figures in your kingdom when you come into your kingdom? You see what they're thinking of. You see what is in their mind. They obviously had not understood the meaning of what Jesus had said was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. I, I don't know how they could have. The three of them came to Jesus and Salome knelt, knelt before him and, and, and asked him to appoint again her sons to these two highest positions under Jesus in his kingdom once he established it, which I think was clear they thought was going to be soon. And I think we're going to see here as we move through what we're looking at today, there were many people who assumed that was what was going to happen when Jesus got to Jerusalem. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves. So Jesus asked him if they were prepared to what? To drink the cup that he was going to drink. Well, what, what, what cup? Was he, was he sharing a mug? Uh, like a mug of coffee or, huh? Uh, okay, well, yeah, yeah. in the Old Testament, uh, frequently a cup, or more often a bitter cup, is used to uh, picture or symbolize uh, judgment or punishment, especially from, from God. See Psalm 75, 8, Isaiah 51, 17 through 18, Jeremiah 25, 15 through 28. All three are good references, but it's, there, there are many of them. But the, the, this reference, this use of a bitter cup, drinking a bitter cup means receiving, receiving judgment or, or punishment. But again, the, the disciples had not understood what Jesus was talking about relative to drinking his cup in terms of the great, the great suffering that he was going to go through and even being killed, surely they didn't understand that. Maybe, maybe they were thinking they were going to have to struggle at his side, you know, go through some struggles as he established his kingdom, but, then, but they were still focusing ultimately that they were, they were going to rise in victory beside him. They'd have to fight with him, and they were really ready to do that. That's about the only thing I can picture that, th that they're thinking in their head. I, I do not believe, and others don't believe either, that they were getting it, that he, what he had just said, that he was going to suffer greatly and then even die. They had no idea how much Jesus would suffer. And I don't think they got it yet that he was going to die. And I don't think they got it that he was not going to establish the kingdom anytime soon. As a matter of fact, has the kingdom been established yet? No. No. It is often ignorance that seeks leadership, power, and glory. That's a quote from somebody. I forget who I got it from, so I can't give him credit. But those oftentimes it is through ignorance that people seek leadership, power, and glory. The brothers did not know what they were asking, nor did they understand what they were claiming to be willing to go through. Jesus told them that they would indeed someday drink from His cup of suffering. That's what He was saying to them. Someday you are going to suffer as I will, or in a way like I will. James eventually became what? The first apostle to be murdered, martyred for his faith. And John would eventually, what would eventually happen to John? He, he was condemned to exile on the island of Cyprus. Yes, as an, old, as an old man. And as best we know, the only one of the twelve who did not die an, an early and violent death. Both of them surely suffered before those fates as well, once 
Jesus rose in, from the dead and went back to heaven as they started in the early church. Jesus also told them that it wasn't up to him to assign positions of power in the kingdom. Who, who, has, who had already done that? God the Father. He said they've all, he's already established who is going to have those positions of authority in the kingdom. First of all, we need to be wary, uh, us today, we need to be wary of seeking worldly wealth and honor and power and, and authority and that kind of stuff because that kind of stuff often brings with it anxiety and temptation and disappointment and envy. And if we are to reign with Jesus in His future kingdom, the Bible clearly and repeatedly says that we must suffer for Jesus in a way, even suffer with Jesus. See Matthew chapter 10, Romans chapter 8, 2 Timothy chapter 2, Revelation chapter 1. All those have references of this. As I've stated before, the idea of Christians suffering for Jesus today is not on the radar screen of a lot of churches. And suffering for Jesus is not on the radar screen of a lot of people sitting in the pews in a lot of churches. It just, that ain't part of the deal. Not in the minds of many, including whole churches. If the tw twelve disciples as a whole grasped anything, again, about Jesus' predictions, about suffering and so forth, I say again that they thought that was just as they struggled at His side to fight to establish the new kingdom. But they perceived that the victory was at hand. They just had to go through the fighting with Him to get there. Surely they didn't believe that the Jewish religious leaders could stop Jesus. Surely they didn't even believe that the Romans could stop Jesus. Why? Because how could anybody defeat the one who, who could control storms? Cause storms to stop at His command. Who could, who could defeat the one who raised someone from the dead? Who could defeat the Messiah who their Scripture clearly prophesied one day would what? Establish what? The kingdom. And they believed Jesus was who? The Messiah. And so how, they did not see any way that they weren't looking at a win here. The kingdom was at hand. Look at what Jesus had already done. They believed without a doubt He was the Messiah. And the Scripture said the Messiah would establish the kingdom. The problem is they didn't understand the timing. They didn't get the timing of things because the kingdom still isn't established yet. And they didn't understand that Jesus had something even more important to do when He came the first time. They did not understand the timing of the rise of the Messiah's kingdom in all His glory. See Luke chapter 19. They did not understand that Jesus would soon accomplish something much more significant even when He would die on the cross. They did not understand that Jesus would provide a way for sinners to be what? Forgiven, saved, reconciled with God, redeemed. Fill in any of those scriptural terms. They're all right. And that that salvation would be applied not only to Jews, but Gentiles. to all people, non-Jews, Gentiles included. Verses 24 through 28. When the ten heard about this, who, who would the ten be? The, the twelve mi minus James and John. And that answers then, what's the this? Heard about this. Heard about what? about how they went and asked to have the most powerful positions in Jesus' kingdom when He brought that in. So when the other ten hear about the, 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 what they were asking for, they, they were happy for them, right? And, and hoping that they could get it. Is that, was that it? Oh yeah, James and John, they deserve that. They, yeah, they should have it. That's the way it was, right? Uh, oh no, you must have read this already. I hope you did. It says they were indignant with the two brothers Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your what? Servant. Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your? Slave. Slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. 
and to give his life as a ransom. ransom for many. So the other ten were not expressing any kind of righteous anger or anything like that. How dare they ask for such a thing? No, as some have put it, more likely they were sorry that they hadn't thought of it first. <laughs> sorry, I should have got in there and asked for that first. Oh, darn it. They were indignant. They were reacting with jealousy. After all, they no doubt thought, we deserve high positions as much as James and John do, don't we? Jesus used the situation to teach more about the true values of His kingdom. And make sure you see that this applies for us as well. Nothing has changed. The values of the kingdom are the values of the kingdom. The twelve didn't get it. Guess what? You and I may not get it either. That's why we study these things. What is the application? What's this mean to us? Why does it matter to me what the twelve did? Because we do the same things, right? That's why it matters. That's why we got to understand and make application to our own lives. Jesus used this situation to contrast what was viewed as greatness among non-believing pagans in the Romans, uh, the Roman culture of that day, with how God views greatness in His kingdom. And guess which one we need to look look at in our lives? We need to look at God's view of what is greatness in His kingdom. Not what our world perceives greatness to be. We need to be concerned with what God considers greatness to be in His kingdom. A true follower of Jesus is to have the humility of who? What people? Servants and slaves. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing God? Are you hearing Jesus? He's saying great people in His kingdom conduct themselves as servants or slaves. We all on board? We all on board to conduct ourselves as servants and slaves in this life? So some of you at least shouldn't be nodding your head, yeah, because I have an idea that you're not there yet. I have an idea that you're not right ready to be a slave. In the unbelieving world, power and authority define greatness. And very often, government rulers, high officials, others in authority use their power and authority to, to dominate, to have tyranny over people. They, they flaunt their authority with, with like, I'm up here and you're down there kind of an attitude, or I'm better than you kind of an attitude. Jesus wasn't condemning, now don't mistake this, Jesus wasn't condemning authoritative structure in government, workplace, uh, churches, homes, that, that there is an appropriate place for, for authoritative structure in all those places. Home, church, workplace, government, so forth. No question. Jesus wasn't condemning that. That wasn't the issue. He was proclaiming that positions of power, authority, and leadership are not what determines greatness among believers in God's kingdom. Following the example of Jesus defines greatness in His kingdom. A true follower of Jesus, again, is to have the humility of a servant or a slave. The person who is truly great, by heaven's definition, is the one who has an attitude of submission to others. Oh, we all love to submit to other people, right? We all love to submit ourselves to other people's wishes, don't we? Yeah, huh? NASA, now you're, you're getting it. You're not, no, you're not saying, oh yeah, yeah, I love that. Because we know we don't. This doesn't mean that we're expected to just do anything anybody asks. That's not what this is about. But greatness among the followers of Jesus is based upon serving others. With Jesus as the model. The twelve disciples didn't understand it yet. I'm hoping we're starting to understand it. But Jesus had demonstrated and exemplified greatness in becoming a servant, going clear back to when in the eternal timeline. What would you think? When Jesus, when before he was Jesus, who was the being that became Jesus? The second person of the Trinity. The second person of the Trinity of God. When he submitted to the Father and was willing to do what? To take on a human body. To, to come to the earth 
to live nine months in the womb of a young virgin woman, to be then born in poopy's diapers and all this stuff we've talked about before. You want to talk about willing to humble yourself? Willing to be submissive? Jesus is the model. First of all, He did that as, all, as, as part of the Almighty God Trinity. He, the second person, did all that at the Incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. That was the first thing He did to, to exemplify greatness in becoming a servant. He made Himself nothing by taking on a human body and coming to the earth as a servant. And then throughout His life here on the earth, what did Jesus do? Served. He even said, what, what did we just read? He did not come to be served. He came to serve Himself. And then when Jesus was speaking this stuff to the twelve, as recorded here, that we're reading in Matthew 20, as He spoke that to Him, what was He, what was he preparing to do? He was preparing to suffer torture and a horrible death on the cross. He was preparing to provide the greatest example of greatness ever. He would die on that cross to provide a way for sinful people like me and you to receive forgiveness for their sins. See Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And by all rights, I should be going back and including that in this message, but you know how it goes. I never have time. We're always running behind and late and all that kind of stuff. But that talks about we that talks about the servant Jesus. Starting back with his being willing to come down to the earth in the first place and forever change himself by allowing himself to be attached to a human body. He still has that human body that albeit it's glorified now, and he will forevermore. That is the humility of servanthood. That Jesus provides the example for the greatest example of greatness that we can have. And the model for us <laughs> to follow, again, high bar, right? Jesus is our model for serving. You want to try to live up to that one? We're supposed to try. That's what we're supposed to shoot for, but you know we'll never reach that level. But what He wants to do, He wants us to try. Jesus had come to the earth to serve others, pay that awful ransom price for sin with His own lifeblood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen? Amen? And hallelujah, what a perfect example of the greatness of serving others. The question, though, the application, what does this mean for me? Is how well am I doing at following His example? How well are you doing at following the example of Jesus. The high bar. But again, the whole point is, how do we apply this? What does it mean for me? It means for me is, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm to follow, I'm to imitate the model that Jesus has provided for us. Lastly, Jesus referred to Himself again in verse 28 as the Son of Man, just as he had done in verse 18 that we looked at earlier. I want to address this Son of Man thing real quickly here. Quickly is a relative term, but quickly. <laughs> quickly as I can. The expression Son of Man occurs 81 times in the Gospels. 81 times. 79 of them are direct quotes from Jesus. Now, everybody good at math? 81 minus 79 is... Two, okay, a big, well, not everybody got that, but a lot of you said the answer. Some of you are, uh, uh, so, yeah. Two other times, the two other times Son of Man's mentioned in the Gospels. The Gospels, of course, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. First four books of the New Testament. The other two times, somebody was quoting Jesus saying it. So, 79 of the times Jesus is quoted directly. The two other times Son of Man's used in the Gospels, somebody was quoting what Jesus said about being the Son of Man. The Old Testament was the origin of Jesus' favorite way to, res to refer to Himself. And where, can you tell me where in the Old Testament Jesus would have got this idea to refer to Himself as the Son of Man? Well, that's a good guess, but no. No. Yes, back here. Daniel. 
in the, I, we will, maybe next spring, we'll go back and do the book of Daniel again. Uh, but, but anyway, yes, it was Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Um, that, that is the most attention-grabbing, significant reference to the Son of Man in the Old Testament because in that vision, remember who, became, who, who came before the throne of the Ancient of Days? The Son of Man. The Son of Man. It reads, Daniel saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And he was given authority and glory and sovereign power. And all peoples and nations of every language worshipped him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. End quote. When Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, he was pointing out that he was the one Daniel talked about, prophesied about, coming someday. He was that Son of Man. The Son, God the Son, is the Son of Man that Daniel referred to. And so when the Son of Man was brought into the presence of the Ancient of Days in Daniel's vision, and of course the Ancient of Days represented again God the Father, in Daniel's vision the Ancient of Days gave all this authority and glory and sovereign power to this Son of Man. And that authority, glory, and power has been exercised though, and still is being exercised today, by, by what rulers depicted by the beasts that uh, God gave the, Daniel the visions of? Who did those beasts represent? Gentile rulers and nations that would successively exercise authority and rulership over the earth and especially dominance over whom? Israel. Over the nation of Israel. All of this we got from our study in Daniel, right? No, I said, yep, yep, I, yeah, everybody remembers that, right? Amen. 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 Yes. Good. Good deal. And if you don't, you can always go back and watch the videos again. Uh, it'll take you a while, but it was uh, four and a half months of preaching, I think. All this stuff, though, is what we looked at. It's important to tie all that that we looked at in the book of Daniel into Jesus referring to himself as being the Son of Man. He fulfilled, he, he fulfilled or began to fulfill the, the prophecy of this one who would come into the presence of the Ancient of Days. And now you who are with me in Sunday school, going through the book of Revelation, do you see the, the tie in there? Where is the tie in there? Come on! <laughs> What? He comes before. They, they're crying. John's weeping. There, who, there's this scroll and there's nobody can be found to open it, right? Who can open the seals? And there's nobody. And, and John's crying. And, and one of the elders comes before him and says, Don't cry. Look. And who is it? The lamb. The lamb, the lamb looking as if he had been slain. And, and, and he comes before the Father's throne. And the Father gives him what? The scroll with the seven seals on it and so forth. And, he, and, that, and that what's represented is this power. It's, it's going back to Daniel 7 again, where the Son of Man came into the presence of the Ancient of Days. You see how it all fits together? Please see it. Please see it. You follow me? And especially, again, you guys that have been with the, the study in Sunday school, the Bible study in Revelation, you see it ties into Matthew. It all ties back to, to Daniel. You see how it fits together? You see how it's cool? <laughs> At least see how it's a little bit cool. Come on, man. I hope I didn't break my scroll. <laughs> oh, daggone it, it's good. When this vision in Daniel is fulfilled, it, it, will be, it won't be fulfilled until when? <laughs> yes, when Jesus comes back. When, when, is this, when is this stuff going to happen? When will the rulership of the Gentiles... Well, who's going to be the final Gentile ruler? The Antichrist. We're going to stay here all afternoon until we get this. <laughs> Dang good it, we're going to get it. And then we'll go shoot clay pigeons, guys. You're going to have to get it first. Yes, it's all this stuff ties together. When Jesus returns, that's whenever this stuff will be fulfilled. And Jesus will bring these judgments upon the earth. He will open the seals. He will become the conquering king. He will bring an end to the days of the Gentiles. He will rule over the world. And He will rule over the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus will have authority and glory and sovereign power over all peoples of the earth. 
In John chapter 5, Jesus said that the Father had entrusted all authority, all authority to judge to who? The Son. The Son. And that's because the Son is the Son of Man in Daniel's vision. And the Son is the Lamb in the book of Revelation who comes to the Father's throne to take the scroll because He alone has the authority to open the seals and bring the judgments upon the earth and then return to the earth to take power and authority over the earth. You follow? Yeah. You copy? <coughs> you copy, Davy? <coughs> there you go. There are also other Old Testament references to the Son of Man in different contexts. Tina, you brought up one of them. In Ezekiel, God referred to the prophet Ezekiel as Son of Man. Different context, though. Different context. It ties back, though, to Jesus because Ezekiel was a Jewish man, and certainly Jesus was a Jewish man on the earth as well. It's also uh, used in Psalm 8, verse 4, to refer to mankind in general. And then it's also um, one other place, uh, Psalm 80, verse 17. It's actually used to figuratively uh, refer to the nation of Israel. And so all those things can point to Jesus being the ultimate Son of Man and so forth. But there are those other scattered references. But the, the primary reference that we've got to focus on for Son of Man is Daniel chapter 7. Because that's what ties all this stuff I just hopped around about. And the quiz at the end of the service will cover that very thoroughly. Uh, let's go to verses 29 through 34. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed, and two blind men were sitting by the, sh the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. They shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them, What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, We want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Jericho, from Jericho, it would have only been a one-day journey to Jerusalem. They were, they were almost there. One, one, one day of walking, and they were going to be in Jerusalem. The large crowd that was following Jesus at that point, a lot of them surely had Messiah fever. Like a lot of them, they, they had seen and or heard of miracles He had done. A lot of these people were becoming convinced Jesus was the Messiah. And man, they're, they're pumped for what's going to happen when they get into Jerusalem. And they're figuring, one of the things they're figuring they're going to even see is Jesus come to His messianic throne. And the natural then aftermath of that would be that He'll start kicking the hind ends of the Romans. That's, that's what people are starting to see at, a, at this case that are following along on this journey into Jerusalem. Understand that there are, already, there are also a bunch of other people that would have been included in the crowd that might not necessarily have Messiah fever, at least yet, but because there were large groups of people traveling to, to Jerusalem for what? For the Passover feast. Remember when Jesus was crucified, it was Passover. In any case, the two blind men who were begging at the side of the road either previously heard about Jesus doing miracles and, and the growing belief that, that He was the promised Messiah or else somebody had told them as He approached. One way or the other, they knew who Jesus was. And if He was the Messiah, which they believed He was from, apparently from what they had heard, they knew what the Old Testament talked about that the Messiah would be able to do. They called Him Son of David. That's another Messianic title because the Messiah was to descend from who? He was descended from the line of David. They were acknowledging that they believed He was Messiah. They may have been physically blind, but they spiritually saw who Jesus was. And He was the Messiah. The Old Testament repeatedly states that Messiah will descend from David and rule on His throne over Israel. Isaiah 9, 7 and 11, 1 are two of the references. At the time of Jesus' public ministry, there was an intense expectation among the Jews of the coming of the promised Messiah. Messiah's reign was promised to be a time that the eyes of the blind would be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the, lamb would le or the lame would leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb shout for joy, Isaiah chapter 35. The blind beggars believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed He could heal what? Their blindness. 
So they repeatedly cried out to him to have mercy on them. People in the crowd, of course, harshly con condemned them and, and, and told him to shut up and probably stop bothering him. He's an important holy man, you know, quit bothering him. Beggars were outcasts in Jewish society. And even though the Mosaic law demanded that the needy in Israel be provided for, few of the religious leaders would have had anything to do with beggars. You know why? What do you think they would have feared would have happened to them if they got close to, the, to people like that? That they would, be, that they would be, become ceremonially unclean. Especially if they happened to even mistakenly come into contact, physical contact with them. But Jesus was different. Very different. And the people then needed to get used to different, right? And you know what? Still today, we need to get used to different. So, a, a different different. We need to get used to something different from what many of us heard in churches for a long time. Because what we find when we study the Bible is, wait a minute, somebody has been leading me astray here. Like this stuff isn't matching up with some of the, a lot of the stuff maybe even for some people that I've been taught through the years. We got to get used to different because the real story about Jesus and who he was and is is often different from the idea that people have today. Jesus not only came near to the blind beggars, he what? Touched, touched. He touched them and he healed their blindness and immediately they followed him. They believed who he was. He proved who he was in, in healing them. And this growing crowd set out for Jerusalem in anticipation of participating in the, in the Passover celebration. And again, many in that crowd, many of them, I'm sure, expected to see a lot more when they got to Jerusalem. Many of them expected to see Jesus assume the Messianic throne and start maybe delivering them from the oppressive reign of the Romans. What they would witness as they entered Jerusalem would actually flame, fan the flames of their excitement into a blazing fire. And that's what chapter 21, the beginning of chapter 21 is about. And I'm going to fly through it. Hang in there with me. We've got to get to it because that, all this leads up to it. All this leads up to the, the, the wrong expectations. Of the, the, his triumphal, into, triumphal entry into Jerusalem is a big part of all this. And they were anticipating this. And a lot of these people expected big things to have come of this. But it was going to end up being something different. But his entry into Jerusalem was the first part of, of the story here. Intro to chapter 21. This, this is often referred to as the triumphal entry. It, what, what, did, what do we call the day we celebrate it on each year? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. It was the high point of the popularity of Jesus in His earthly life. He entered the city in the midst of, a, of the praises of a cheering crowd. But as we know, less than a week later, many of those people who were cheering the praises in the crowd, less than a week later were shouting what? Crucify, Crucify Him. It's all part of what, what went on as this stuff was coming to a head. Jesus rightly presented Himself that day to the nation of Israel as the promised Son of David, the Anointed One, the Messiah. It marked the completion of the 69 sevens. Oh, yes, we're going back to Daniel again. I am sorry, but we are, because it did. How did it do that? How did it, how did it mark the completion of the 69 sevens? Anybody know? The 69 sevens were to begin when? At, at the issuing of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Right. Yes. <laughs> that's right. She's agreeing with me. That's cool. It's, that's when it was to start. 69 sevens were 69 what? Well, the weeks was figurative. 69 what? Seven days. Not seven days. Good heavens. Seven years. 69 seven-year periods or 483 years. And so that, that period was to begin with the issuing of the decree to re rebuild Jerusalem. And when was that period to end? When was that 69 sevens, 483 years to end? After the, the decree of the, uh, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. When the Messiah came, well, that's a safe enough answer, and that's and that's that, 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 that's that, that's that's good. That's good. That's that's good. Um, it, it's it's when the Anointed One would come, and the Anointed One is is, is the Messiah. Yes, 
And so that, that's what Daniel predicted. And do any of you remember when I did Daniel, when I did the number calculations and how the, then the numbers come out, that the day we, we can tie down based on, this, on an, what many believe is the date that the decree was issued to rebuild the, Jerusalem, and we can track through 483 years, whether we do it by Jewish calendar or the Gregorian calendar by which we go by, and it leads up to a day at the, like in the beginning of April, end of March, beginning of April, when Passover was, and when Jesus would have rode into Jerusalem to present Himself as the Anointed One. The 69 sevens, 483 years, down to a day can be calculated to be shown, to be fulfilled when He rode in to Jerusalem. Amen. Less than a week later, Daniel's prophecy then, Daniel's prophecy in, uh, continued to say that after the 69 sevens, what would happen? Hint, it involves the anointed one. What would happen to the anointed one? He would be cut off. He would be cut off. And that would be, that was fulfilled when what happened? The crucifixion of Jesus. Less than a week after he rode into Jerusalem, the crucifixion, he was cut off. He was killed on the cross. All fulfilling what we studied in the book of Daniel. The homework for next time is to watch all the sermons on the book of Daniel. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Okay, verses 21, 1 through 5. We'll run through this really fast. I know we're, we're late as always. Okay, here we go. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Stories familiar to many of us. Jesus sent two disciples into the village, told them to bring back, they'd find this donkey and her colt, and they were supposed to bring them back. He said, if anybody asked them what was going on, tell them, what? The Lord needs them. And I believe that the Holy Spirit was preparing all that, preparing the people's hearts who would have objected to it and so forth. They went in, found the donkeys, and, and brought them back to, to Jesus. And again, it fulfilled this, this passage in, in what minor prophet book? Zechariah. It's one of the few verses that any of you, other than the ones who have, were in the men's Bible study in the book of Zechariah, probably have, the only verse you've probably heard out of Zechariah is Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a colt, on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Again, what happened here, as Matthew wrote, fulfilled what the prophet Zechariah had predicted some 500 years previously. Amen? Amen. Verses 6 and 8. 6 through 8. Chapter 21, 6 through 8. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed the cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And so again, they found the, the, the donkey and the colt, brought it to Jesus. And the custom of that day was to, to lay outer garments or cloaks, coats, as well as small branches from trees uh, on the road in front of a king as he entered it. It was kind of like in ancient times rolling out the red car carpet type of deal. It was whatever. Why it meant that, I don't know, but when a king would ride into a city, they would, they would blanket the road in front of him as he rode in with their outer garments as well as branches that they would break off of, off of trees. In John chapter 12, verse 13, it specifies the kind of tree that they broke branches off of, which of course was a, palm, were palm trees, and from which we get the name that we call the day we remember this time, Palm Sunday. And so again, it was a royal procession going into Jerusalem, uh, Jesus purposely setting up to present himself as king. Verse 9, verse 9, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So Jesus rode the cold in the midst of this crowd. Some were in front of him. Others were behind him. They're all shouting this praise, celebrating the arrival of Israel's Savior, the Messiah, King. Hosanna literally means to save. By this time it was often used as a shout of praise for God's salvation. Jesus was joyously proclaimed to be the royal son of David. 
And the phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, was taken from Psalm 118. Um, the person who comes in the name of the Lord represented Yahweh and, and, and was, was blessed to, to be able to represent Yahweh. In this case, the one who came in the name of the Lord, what? Was, was Yahweh. Jesus was God and is God in a human body. Normally, the person who came in the name of the Lord was, was blessed because they were coming into the name of the Lord. In this case, the one who came into the Lord was the Lord. He was Yahweh. Hosanna in the highest gave pro, uh, praise to Yahweh, who is the highest and who lives in the highest heaven. The, uh, the saying in Luke 2, 14, glory to God in the highest, that we have at Christmas time that the angels sang, that that's a similar statement. The people praised God in the highest heavens for sending the Messiah and anticipated that He would do what? Yeah, come on, man. <laughs> come on, you've got to stick with me. I promise we're almost done here. He, they were anticipating the Messiah when He was anointed King would deliver them from the wicked Romans, the hated Romans. That's, what they were, that's why they were so excited. They were looking forward to Him doing that. They did not grasp the, the idea of the suffering servant found in Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, verse 12. And my understanding is that most of the Jewish rabbis taught that the suffering servant spoken of there in Isaiah and in in those references, um, they believed, they taught that that suffering servant pictured the whole nation of Israel, not the Messiah. They were not, they did not understand those verses and what they meant that the Messiah had to suffer. Verses 10 and 11. Last two verses. Honest, I can't add any verses. Verse 10, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The royal procession made its way through Jerusalem. The whole city got stirred up. It was likely that at least some of the people, and possibly many of them, have heard something about Jesus, but many of them hadn't seen Jesus. And so they're asking, Who is this? What's the commotion? Who's this guy that's riding in and all these crowds are chanting his stuff and so forth? Who is this guy? And the people following Jesus repeatedly answered, what? This is, Jesus. this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So the stage was set for the climax of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. Storm clouds were going to soon gather, though. The Jewish religious leaders at this point referenced Luke 19, verse 39, and John 12, verse 19. The Jewish religious leaders were ticked. They're mad. And soon the adoring crowd would be mad too. Because the adoring crowd would realize that Jesus wasn't going to what? Bring, bring in the kingdom and kick out the Romans because they're going to see Him standing beaten and in chains, ca held captive by the Romans. And they would turn against Him. These following words, close with this. You don't have to close up your Bibles or anything yet, but we'll close with this. All glory, laud, and honor... To thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna's ring, thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name comest, the King and Blessed One. And these words are written not only to reflect the praise and honor and glory that were given to Jesus that day, but they're also to express the praise and glory and honor that we should be giving to Jesus still today. And we see that here in the, in the second and the third stanzas here. The company of angels, angels are praising thee on high, and mortal men and all things created make reply. The people of Hebrews, with the people of the Hebrews, with palms before thee went. Our praise and prayer anthems before thee we present today. To thee, before thy passion, they sang their hymns of praise. To thee, now high exalted, our melody we raise. Thou didst accept their praises, accept the praise that we bring today, Lord, who in all good delightest, thou good and gracious King. Those are the lyrics to the closing hymn, All Glory, Lord, Laud, and Honor. And I'm out of strength and voice and everything else. All glory, 